Yes. Yeah. I'm Carolyn Cooper, and I'm a writer, a literary critic, cultural analyst. I write a newspaper column for the Jamaica Gleaner. Okay. First of all, I'd just like to say, I love your dreads. I love your hair. It's amazing. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's amazing. Yes. It's amazing. Um, so, you're a critic. Yes. These days. What's, what's the favourite book you've created? You've created? Literature. It's um, Caribbean literature. And I also do popular culture. I've looked at reggae, dance hall. Okay. And, you know, just really trying to explore black people's creativity, particularly from the Caribbean. Okay. How long have you been in, the, in this world? I've been in the field for about 40 years. 40 years? Yes. 40 years? Yes. Don't mind me asking, how old are you? How old 67. Are you? You're 67? <laughs> yes. Wow. wow, you look amazing. Thank you, thank you. God is good. Yeah. Black don't crack. <laughs> <laughs> Living proof. Yes, so I was an undergraduate at the University of the West Indies in Jamaica, the Mona campus, from 1968 to 71. Mm -hmm. And then I was fortunate to get a fellowship to the University of Toronto. From 71 to 75, I was there. I did my MA and my PhD in literature. Then I got a job teaching in Massachusetts. And the job market was so bad in those days that I considered abandoning literature for law. What was, what was bad about the job market? There were no jobs. <laughs> it's a bit like now, where it's so hard for young, young academics to get jobs, proper mm. jobs. Mm. And I decided to go to law school. I got into seven of the ten law schools I got. I applied to. I didn't get into Harvard. I was on Wales, Yale's waiting list. I didn't get into University of Toronto, but I got into the rest of them, including Georgetown, which is where I really wanted to go. But the same year, I got the job at the University of the West Indies and decided to come home rather than abandon the profession. And I have not regretted not um, going to do law. My sister, who is a lawyer, says, I'm practicing law without a license. But she sees some of the letters that I write <laughs> when I get into contention with people. So where, yes. did the, where, where did the passion for, for you do start then? Or what, where did I, the I, I guess as a child I enjoyed words, I enjoyed language, I used to love to read. And my mother was a teacher and I decided I would become a teacher too. And because I was fortunate to get tertiary education, I was able to get a teaching job at university. And that's where it started, just in the home, reading and enjoying the power of the word. And do you do any writing yourself? Well, I do academic writing, of course, oh, but yeah, not, course. not quote-unquote creative writing, although I believe all writing is creative. Yeah. But my students, for example, at the University of the West Indies, used to tell me, but miss, you're not writing your memoirs. <laughs> I said, I'm not too fast, it's my business and I want to know. I said, yes, <laughs> of course, it's your business and I want to know. So I really haven't done anything like that. But I've been tempted to do a little creative writing. One of my colleagues, Maureen Warner-Lewis, she's a, you know, she keeps telling me that I would write great fiction because she thinks I have a, you know, mm -hmm. that kind of imagination. insight and imagination. But I really think that my métier is the essay where I just write what I think. Yeah. And my newspaper column has given me a good opportunity to do that. Oh. And I'm, at the moment, I'm doing a selection of the columns of publication. I have over 600 columns. Wow. I started writing 25 years ago for the Jamaica Observer. I wrote for them for five years until me and them fall out. Oh, okay. <laughs> Why did you fall out? Yeah, you, man, you know how it is. Um, sometimes you have these editors who are very... Um, protective of what they think you should be writing about. Yeah. Edward Siago, um, former Prime Minister, I think he might have been leader of the opposition then, I can't remember if was Prime Minister, had a most unfortunate um, slip of the tongue where he described, you know, he said, um, he said that um, the People's National Party, which would be the opposition to his, is not the party now of Norman Manley, the elder statesman, or Norman Manley, his son, but it's a mongrel party. And it's a black man at the time who was head of the party. And of course, people immediately said that Siaga was calling black people dogs. <laughs> of course. So there was a talk show host, Mutty Perkins, Wilma Perkins, he died now. And he was on the radio telling people that mongrel does not mean dog. So I promptly called him and read the Oxford English Dictionary definition of mongrel, the first of which is a dog of no definable, no definable breed. So he said, oh! You know, I said, yes, mongrel means dog. And we had a conversation of over an hour. So it was so entertaining. People told me they got to their destinations and couldn't leave their cars because they wanted to see how this was going to end up. 
So he got, you know, got mad because he got into all kinds of little twists and turns. Sorry, right? sorry to, was this on, like, on, the, ra on, the, on the radio? On the radio, on the radio. And um, eventually he said, oh, you know, he wishes that he could let people outside of Jamaica hear this conversation to know the kind of idiots that are teaching at the University of the West Indies. He was very anti-University of the West Indies, he used to call it an intellectual ghetto. And so I thought, well, this is a very good idea. So I sat down and I transcribed our conversation. And at the time I was writing a column for the Jamaica Observer and I asked them if they would, you know, allow me to publish the transcript. They said, the, the senior editor said yes. And this Friday, the column usually comes out on a Friday, I sent the first part to the um, opinion page editor and she didn't publish it. She said she had to get legal advice about whether or not she could publish it and she didn't. And so what I did, I just sent the subsequent um, segments as part of my regular column which she published. But then the first bit did not um, get published in the regular slot. It was published on a Saturday where she said she, by her own admission, they don't have that many readers on the Saturday. So the people who read the second and third parts kept asking about the first part. So I brought back the first part yeah. after the other two and she refused to publish it because she said she had published it already. So I sent nothing more to them. So that's how we fell out. So you haven't spoken to them since? Yes, oh, yeah, man. You know, Jamaica is small. Yes. Um, what advice would you give to people who are facing opposition in the West Indies? Well, like yeah, well, you see, fortunately for me, writing a newspaper column was not affecting my career. This was just something I was doing as a hobby. But people in the workplace who have problems, you have to know how to negotiate. If you have to stay in the job because you can't do better, then sometimes you just have to submit to some kinds of basic abuse that you wouldn't want to accept. But it's a question of job survival and basic economic survival. If you have many options, then you can walk off the job. But if you don't have many options, you know, you kind of just have to grin and bear it. Have you got into a lot of trouble or disagreements over the things you publish? Absolutely. Yeah. One of the disagreements I get into trouble about is the fact that I advocate the recognition of Jamaican as a language. It's the mother tongue of most Jamaicans, mm -hmm. but it is still devalued as broken English. Mm -hmm. It has no status in Jamaica as an official language. Mm -hmm. So when I used to write for the Observer, I used to write a bilingual column, one week in English, one week in Jamaican. And the abuse I would get, you know, people saying this is a waste of space, why is the New York? I just press along. And the newspaper wanted me to write three columns in English and one in Jamaican. I said, no, equal, play. And they said, oh, the columns in English are so good. Why don't you just write it? No. So I won that battle with them. So after I had this falling out with them and stopped writing, then I ended up doing TV. A colleague of mine, Leah Kim Samaj, and I, we did a program called Man and Woman Story, a gender-focused um, program. Did that for a year. And then um, I did some, I did a current affairs program on another television station. And then eventually, it now is 2009, the Gleaner asked me to write a column. But imagine when the fellow invites me to write the column, he says, I don't know if I should let you loose on the Jamaican public. Is that your so, reputa reputation? So I said to him, it's who you're calling bad dog. <laughs> <laughs> but then I agreed to do it, you know, so I've been doing it now for nine to almost a decade. Yeah. So, yes. Do you, do you ever get phased by that reputation? Or no, by man. Yeah, you have to, you know, water off a duck's back and your back has to be broad because otherwise you don't do what you have to do if you get bothered by what people think. You know, you just have to go through and who like it, like it, who don't like it, don't like it because even now, after writing for the Gleaner nine years, people still complain about the columns I write in Jamaican. And at first, you know, I was writing in English. I didn't negotiate with them the way I'd negotiated with the Observer to do a bilingual column. So I write in English. And, but you know, in Jamaica, you can't write exclusively in English because there are some things yeah, that I just, words just that said better in yeah, Jamaican. Yeah. And so I would drop in some things and then they would carry on that the column is supposed to be in English. Well, one week a man wrote to say, the comments section, that he's not going to read any more of my columns in English. Because since I'm carrying on about Jamaican being a language, all the columns must be written in Jamaican. He's not reading anymore. Of course, he's been sarcastic. 
So I wrote the column in English and I said, you know, just in case he hadn't been able to resist reading the English, towards the end, I've had maybe two paragraphs in Jamaican to make him happy. You know, the editor said they are not going to publish a column with the two paragraphs in, in Jamaican because it's supposed to be a column in English. So I told him, either you publish it or you don't publish it, you know. So they didn't publish it. So I didn't send any more columns to them for about three months. Everywhere I go, what time to the column? Because it's a very, it's a very popular column. What time? I said, go and ask the Gleaner. So eventually, I don't know if you remembered when Volkswagen did an ad with a fellow from the Midwest speaking in Jamaican. And it was one of the ads that they did for the Super Bowl a few years ago. It was a fantastic ad. So I, I, I got in touch with the Gleaner. I said, imagine VW is using our language to sell cars and I am a writer in Jamaica mm -hmm. and I can't use our language in the newspaper. So the guy, the editor asked to meet with me and he met and, um, well, what did I really want? Of course, I didn't terrorize him by saying that I would want a strictly bilingual column. So I said, well, maybe I could write once a month in Jamaica. And they were so desperate to get back the column, they agreed. So now I write once a month in Jamaica. And I said, serves them right because I was just writing the occasional phrase or or um, you know, paragraph in Jamaican, but now they forced my hand and I said, I'm not going to take the whole thing in Jamaican. Then on top of that, I used two orthographies. I used a system that I call Chaka Chaka, which is sort of English based. And Chaka Chaka is a Jamaican Creole word, meaning all uh, mixed up. Yeah. And then I also used a writing system that was developed by a linguist, Frederick Cassidy. It's called, I call it proper proper. And it looks strange. It sort of looks like Dutch because it's, you know, it's phonetic. So then you get people quarreling that they can't read that one. But they say, but you can't read the other one. It's the same text, yeah. you know, but it's in two versions. Yeah. Why do you think people have such a problem with the Jamaican di dialect language? It's Mental slavery. Yeah, I was, I was that's, thinking That's that just well. nothing more than that. Yeah. It's colonialism. Yeah. It's the refusal to just combust out of the shackles it's and say... Like it's not good enough. Ah, Jamaican is not good enough. What would be your advice for young black people? I would say it depends on the level at which you are. I am at a point, I mean, I was always like this as an undergraduate. <laughs> you know, I, I was not afraid of authority. You know, the Ghanaians have, a, they have an Adinkra symbol, Jame. I fear no one but God. I believe that I was born with that spirit, that what, why are you going to be afraid? But you know, a lot of people, they are afraid and they don't want to challenge authority. So I say, if you know that you can't do the fight, then you just have to go, as we say, you have to play fool to catch wise. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you have to appear submissive in order to get the greater good. Mm -hmm. So you have to know. And especially young people, most times you're in an establishment, you're pretty low down on the totem pole. People don't take you seriously. They see you're expendable. So you can't go picking fights with authority figures. Mm. What bothers me is established people who still don't want to rock the boat. One of my colleagues at the University of West Indies used to say, he was so amazed that you have an academic board meeting. And these are professors. They don't complain, they don't speak out in the meeting. But when the meeting is over, they caucus in the corridors, you know? What is that? In fact, it got to be so funny that they would not include some of my comments at faculty board in the meeting. Well, you get a lot of trouble with it. Yeah, so I told the campus principal, I'm not coming back to academic board because my comments are not recorded. Mm. Let me give you a classic example. The university puts up welcome signs at the main entrances at the beginning of the academic year. One year, they had a billboard a light-skinned girl and a black fellow at one end and a black girl at the other end with a bag of books. Now this is a campus that's about 80% female. So in the meeting, as they're discussing the beginning of the academic year and the new students, I say, Mr. Chairman, I know that this might appear to be a frivolous concern, but I would like to know what message the university is sending with its billboard. 
are we saying that the few black men on campus will get the light-skinned girl and the black girl will have the consolation of her books meeting mashup <laughs> you, you know and so then the principal is saying that the media the, the the marketing department must run all their ads by me before they send them I said absolutely not mr chairman this is not my job they must know how they are representing the university you have an institute of gender and development studies tell them to collaborate with um the the, the marketing department so it's a level of insensitivity and then you speak out you know so when i speak out then i get the reputation of being a troublemaker but when I stop going to academic board, because, you know, they're not, you know, they're not taking me seriously. People stop me and say, academic board not sweet since you leave. <laughs> you have to start coming back. I say, yes, I am the troublemaker now. <laughs> you all must speak yeah, up. Yeah. yeah. Wait, so where, did, where do you think your spirit came from, though, to have that resilience? You know, I think, think something you're just born with. Uh. And my, on my uh, maternal... My, not my maternal, my paternal, my grand, my mother, my father's grandmother, my, yeah, was a maroon. So I like maroon, you know, the Africans who ran away from plantation slavery and established settlements in the hills. My father is from St. Elizabeth, and so his grandmother, uh, my great grandmother, was a maroon from Akompong. So I like to believe that it's that maroon spirit really in me, but you know, that's just a fanciful way well, of justifying my bad behavior. But has that been a strong link to your identity, knowing that that's where you came from? I believe that's a that, yes, 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 yes. I, I claim that, yeah. that the, that side of me that was not enslaved, mm. you know, that maroon spirit. Now the maroons are very problematic in Jamaican history because they are seen as collaborators with the British. Because once the Maroons signed a treaty with the British to give them their freedom and their autonomy, they were required to send back runaway slaves. So they were seen as, you know, traitors. Yeah. And the famous uh, Morant Bain Rebellion, I don't know if you know about that, where Paul Bogle um, rose up and, you know, just challenged the authority of the whites. Governor Eyre had a whole set of them just killed the maroons um collaborated with the british to um quell that might be uprising yeah. so the maroons have a complicated place in jamaican history at an early stage are seen as freedom fighters because they refused to stay on the plantation and nanny i don't know if you know the name nanny the warrior queen Nona goodison yeah. the poet who was yeah. here at calabas she read that poem in celebration of nanny to say that Nanny was prepared in Africa, she was sent as a warrior queen, yeah. and so she led um, revolts against the British. So there's that positive narrative, but then there's also that sense of the complicity of the Maroons with the British in order to defend their hegemony against the blacks who stayed on the plantation. Wow, that's yeah. Yes. Rich yes. Issue there. Yes. How, um, how long how long will you be writing for, or are you just going to just keep writing? Just keep writing because now I'm retired, but I when I travel and they ask occupation, I certainly do not put pro retired professor, I put writer, mm. you know, and I will continue to write um, as long as people ask me to write. And I have little projects like collecting some of the newspaper columns for publication. Um, because some of them, you reread them and they are classics, they're, they're not dated. Some of them, of course, are dated. They are, you know, newspaper columns by their very nature are sort of um, of the moment. But some of them transcend the moment. And even those of the moment are a good historical record of the issues. What, so, what, what do you like to write about? What's your favorite topic? I write about all kinds of things, although um, last week I wrote about, I don't know if you heard about the case in the U.S. where this... Um, supermarket in South Carolina refused to put cum on a cake. Um, the yeah, because they, they thought, thought that it was, was cum. offensive. They yeah, thought it yeah. was cum, as yeah, in the yeah. slang word for yeah. semen. So I wrote a column, Latin cum mistaken for semen. And, you know, I had fun with it. Somebody posted, Carolyn, you're obsessed with sex. <laughs> <laughs> so 
so I guess maybe I write several <laughs> columns about sex, but I don't think so. I write about sex and politics and music and all kinds of things. Yeah, do you write just solely about Jamaican politics or American no, politics? No, I write, or I write American politics. things. One of my favorite columns I wrote a few years ago when Tiger Woods got into trouble with all of these women that he had. Oh, and 19, then he, apparently. Yes, yeah. and came out of golf intemperally, so I called it Tiger Woods Premature Withdrawal. You know, oh, so, no, I like that. So Pale, people had fun with it. That one circulated in the Caribbean diaspora. What about um, British politics? You ever mentioned not, British politics? Not much. I mean, I've talked about things like the prison, the offer of the prison. The uh, the, prison. the, the prime, former Prime Minister of England offered us a prison. Oh, yes. Yes, yeah, yeah, um, and it's that, yeah, yes see, to, to repatriate. Yes. Can you imagine? That, 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 yeah, it was that a shameful. It infuriated yeah. people. I've written about the Windrush crisis at that whole issue yeah. and um, yeah so in fact one I, I have so many columns I'm going to put them in several books and I have one that I'm calling foreign affairs yeah. a Jamaican perspective foreign yeah, so looking yeah. at some of those they have written about Donald Trump and yeah, yeah. I'm not gonna ask your opinion on Donald Trump because I assume it's already like yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. everybody knows <laughs> Donald Trump no I'm not wasting any time on Donald Trump hmm? November 20, I'm Scorpio. Oh, I'm 22nd. Yeah, all right. <laughs> yes, yes. I, just, I was going to ask you about your determination and yeah. like your, your... I don't really believe in birth signs and this I kind think, of things. Yes. As soon as, as, there's a few things that you said and just your mannerisms and just like... You just thought maybe I was Scorpio. I knew you were Scorpio. <laughs> See, well, maybe there's something to it. <laughs> Yes. Thank you very much. An absolute pleasure. Thank you.